Good evening everyone and welcome back to the virtual international conference on global research trends in biotechnology hosted by the Department of Biotechnology from St Joseph's College of Engineering. Our speaker for the day is Dr Narendran Shekhar who is an eminent scholar with more than 15 years of experience in research. He completed his bachelor's as well as his master's from Anna University and pursued his doctorate in biological and agricultural engineering. from the university of georgia with his dissertation on the investigation of microbial exoelectrogenicity for electrochemical energy conversion he is recognized as an outstanding graduate and received the prestigious bram p varma award for academic excellence and leadership excellence over the years he has been part of several organizations including the bioelectrochemical society igem and the american society for microbiology He is a patent holder and has published about 10 papers in well-known journals such as Biotechnology and Bioengineering and in the IEEE. He has been a judge for various competitions including those held by the Massachusetts Science and Engineering Fair Incorporated and IGEM. He has he was the instructor of the UGA Georgia IGEM team that won the gold medal in the IGEM International Jamboree. Some of his research includes optimizing cell-free bioprocessing technology that produces RNA for agricultural crop protection, engineering pathways for cell-free production of rare biochemicals, and he is also an expert in exploring and optimizing application of microorganisms such as recombinant protein production in E. coli, bioelectricity generation, extra extracellular electron transport in cyanobacteria, and hypothermophiles. Currently, Dr. Narendra Shekhar is a scientist three at Greenlight Biosciences Incorporated and specializes in pathway engineering. It gives us an immense pleasure to have you here with us today, sir. Uh, I request you to take over the session, sir. Let me quickly uh, share my screen. Thank you, Miss Miss Swadika, for a for a very nice introduction, and uh, good evening to one and all. it's been really i would say like uh, uh, you know it's a privilege and also it's honor for me you know to to uh, present or uh, to discuss my expertise and my research experiences and what the thing i'm doing in green light uh, to you guys this evening and uh, and i hope that every one of you is doing well and staying safe and strong both physically and mentally in this in this pandemic season um we will we will be over it all together uh, so on that happy note let's let's get started so for the topic for today is role of rna in solving the world's biggest problems so some of you might have thought that this is really a you know a broad topic right but i indeed it's 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 a broader one so the main reason being as i get to know from the from the organizing committee of this of this conference that majority of you who are hearing are going to be like an undergrad or like you know master students will be pursuing or doing research in your future or uh, you know or maybe you are already doing research uh, as part of your curriculum so i just want you know you guys to get exposed or like think or you know uh, understand that every single molecular biology techniques you learn in your everyday class or like you know every single small experiments that you do has a huge potential or a broader impact in solving some of the some of the world's biggest problem so so science is something like i would say it's like it's 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 inclusive you know like every single thing you do has a huge potential so you need to you need to understand that and that you know start your uh, uh, research career or whatever you are interested in nice okay so let's let's get started uh, so some of the cartoons i have here i have some explanations you know uh, in my in my slide so so let's not worry about that and uh, let me check Uh, as as swathik also introduce if if my slide is not advancing or if my vo voice is breaking please like you know one of you unmute and let me know or like uh, let me know in the chat okay okay right uh, uh, and also there might be some delay when i when i move through the slide so i'm just going to give like a quick like 5 second pause every time i move to a new slide so that every, all of us will be aligned and then everything would be coherent okay okay so i'm going to start with a, a brief you know background on what are the what are the major you know the the problems i have been keep saying so i'm going to touch upon two major problems that that we are all facing today as a human kind and then uh, and then going to introduce like how an important or an essential biomolecule like rna is being exploited or used by you know 
academician industries and 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 everybody else to to solve those two problems mainly being one is the agricultural crop protection and next one is the therapeutic applications of rna and then uh, i will go on and then in the remaining part of the uh, presentation would be how how this rna molecule is being produced through an uh, uh, emerging technology called cell free production or cell free bioprocessing this has been like a new cutting edge technology that has been pursued uh, for both R&D purposes in academia as well as for you know uh, production in, uh, in in some of the uh, emerging or already existing biotech industries and the associated opportunities and challenges. That is going to be my uh, entire uh, uh, talk uh, today. Okay, let's get into the uh, important issues that I am talking about. Number one is the food productivity. Food, food comes first, right? We all I'm thinking that's just the uh, noise. Okay, so we all know that right food is important. Food comes first, correct? Yeah, that is true. So the Food and Agricultural Organization of United Nations (FAO) has recognized this current year, 2020, as an international year of plant health. Okay, the main the main reason being to to educate uh, general public, academicians, industries, and and and, and the policymakers and the business people, or to uh, you know raise awareness on how protecting health of a plant is linked to multifaceted issues right either ending hunger of the world or reducing poverty or protecting the environment ultimately leading to an economic development so all of these multiple issues are linked to you know uh, plant health protection so so mainly through that this, this cartoon is going to explain let me open my inter options okay so the, the reason why i'm saying this is that uh, we all know that population is exploding. We have a growing demand for food. We do not know how we are going to make food for growing population, things like that. And we have like, you know, climatic changes and we have like sustainability, economic, all my, all different problems are already there for, for uh, raising the food production, right? And one thing we all need to remember is that there is an estimate by FAO that publishes, published, uh, the publication says that 40% of the food crops that are we already making are just being lost mainly due to some of the diseases caused by the harmful uh, pest that infect the plants. So think about it. Not only is that we are going to increase the food productivity, the majority of the food that we're already producing out of which 40% is being lost. So if you could at least like tackle this problem in an economic, you know, eco-friendly, sustainable way, that itself is a huge uh, plus. So that's what, that's the reason they, they are, uh, you know, recognizing this year to as a uh, international year of plant health. And as I said, this cotton shows that there are growing demands, environmental impact, everything is interlinked, and there are some beneficial bugs. When I say beneficial bugs, these are like uh, some of the pollinators that help for the, you know, plant propagation, like our butterfly, like honeybees, or uh, uh, other uh, useful, uh, organisms like earthworm, these are all very important for, you know, health of our soil as well as the uh, 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 environment. And on the other hand, we are having a hungry pest. As you might have all seen that there is a locust uh, infestation all over is happening, killing our agricultural land. So there are some hungry pests that is already available. So all of these are linked through one, one big thing is that the pest destruction. When I mean pest, pest meaning the harmful pest that is you know, impacting the plant health. So everything comes under one, finally it's emer uh, merging, or I would say like converging at a point that we need to distract the pest in an, in an efficient way. Okay, that is, that is the issue number one that we are all facing. Okay, moving on um, to issue number two. This is, this is, again, this particular topic does not need any introduction. As we all know, we are all sailing through this, right? The, uh, emerging new uh, uh, diseases, mainly the infectious diseases. Uh, uh, many of us, uh, particularly myself, we are all we keep looking at this particular data set published by John Hopkins uh, database, right? Like, so, so this this basically shows the, uh, you know, the spread of the COVID-19, this is confirmed cases cumulatively over time. We all know this, right? This is, this is right now it's happening. And uh, this is not one of the pandemics. If we look back into the history, human we have seen multiple multiple pandemics like this, multiple pandemics like this. A few of for which for a few of which we have found some solutions through like a vaccination or other a proper uh, uh, biological uh, you know control 
uh, the good example being smallpox that's completely being eradicated. And there are few pandemics or there are few uh, infections that we that we we don't have a control over it and we started you know living with it and we started to think like yeah it's it's happening many things is that you need to be really careful so some some examples would be like you know it's hiv infection or a cholera or things like that and then some of and few of them are 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 very becoming very seasonal it's coming back and back like a, like uh, like a, every every winter season something like that say for example influenza or even our respiratory uh, syndrome, uh, to take for an example, like we have seen SARS, we have seen MERS, now we are seeing COVID. It's, it's something like the trend is keep repeating, like in every decade or every things like that. So, so, so another or upcoming pandemic. I mean, it's it's not too far, right? Like, so this is another very important another second major issue that I'm going to uh, talk about today. So, number one is the food productivity. Number two is the infectious diseases, and I'm going to talk how this uh, RNA as a as a biological uh, or a biochemical has been exploited to solve these two okay okay just like a very quick uh i mean again rna is and everybody knows about rna right as being a uh, biotechnologist like uh, so i don't think it needs a special introduction but i just want to quickly touch base on what is that we are, every one of us might have seen this the central dogma of how the you know cellular processes work we have our dna which basically you know stores the genetic information because that is genome for majority of the living organisms and then it needs to replicate itself to make a you know copy of itself and then it that's how the life is being uh, propagated and uh, to catalyze or to carry out all major cellular functions you need proteins right so protein is the one that is carry out pretty much every 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 basic uh, fundamental uh, reactions or of uh, cellular activities and from this genetic information, how this protein is being produced or doing mainly through a messenger, which is RNA, right? So the RNA is a, is a messenger molecule, which basically gets transcribed and then it's getting going to get translated to form a protein. And this protein is the one that is catalyzing all of these activities. So now one thing is that is RNA only a messenger? Can we say that the, the function of RNA just, you know, stops only at the level of uh, passing the message from uh, from uh, from your genome to your protein i would say uh, no in addition to being messenger you could see some of some of these rna might might well, might be well as an uh, as a genetic information or a genome for some of the rna viruses like if you take like positive or negative single strand viruses and double strand viruses even our sars cov2 is an rna virus some of the most well-known human pathogenic viruses or RNA viruses. So in those viruses, this RNA is a genetic material, right? And uh, in addition to being a genetic material, it can also do a catalytic function, right? Like if, it, if you look at uh, RNA enzymes or like an R ribozymes, they can, they can carry out some of the uh, catalytic functions like a proteins. Or if you take a look at uh, RNA protein complex, say for example, ribosome, it's a, a huge, multi-protein RNA complex, right? That is that is the translation uh, translation machinery in which you have your rRNA, you need to have your tRNA, the, the codes in the mRNA is being getting translated to uh, uh, protein synthesis, basically peptide bond formation is happening. So all of these catalytic, catalytic actions are, you know, uh, taken over, or I would say like uh, RNA plays a major role in addition to the associated proteins. Or uh, look at the if you look at the spliceosomes, so the the uh, pre mRNA that is being uh, freshly transcribed needs to get matured into a you know a fully functional mRNA. All the introns present in this pre mRNA needs to get spliced, needs to get cut off, and all these exons need to get ligated to form a, a fully functional mature mRNA. And RNA plays an important role there. And 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 if you look at Ribose switches or RNAi. RNAi is basically our uh, gene silencing mechanism, RNA interference. So, so mechanisms like this is very important for regulating the gene expression. So you have your genetic makeup, you have your final catalytic function, but to regulate this, to regulate this, you need to have your RNA, right? So like like this, how the, the RNA is it's very central, or I would say its function is crucial to to. So in addition to being like a messenger molecule, its functions is extended beyond or sometimes it, it mimics the functions of a DNA and a protein. Sometimes after after the discovery of these two, there is a very, uh, I would say, like a fascinating uh, uh, hypothesis telling that 
uh, it's a RNA world hypothesis. So there has been like a long debate on like uh, which which uh, uh, RNA like uh, which which has evolved first, whether it is a DNA or it is a protein. And and sometimes the answer lies in it's neither DNA nor protein. It could be an RNA because RNA being a genetic makeup, RNA being a catalytic function, catalytic activity, and RNA has a messenger uh, role. So so look at if you look at the fascinating enzyme like an RNA dependent RNA polymerase or DRP, it could just just from the RNA it can make a copy of RNA. This is how the replication is happening in some of the RNA viruses, and uh, there could be. You know, there could be an uh, ancestral protein that has a, you know, a reverse transcriptase ribosomal activity that can make DNA from an RNA. So that like if, if the condition is favorable in such a way that if you have DNTPs, the RNA could could have synthesis DNA and then and then DNA being more stable take over uh, in the evolutionary uh, aspect because RNA is such a short lived molecule and it's, it's, it's highly unstable compared to compared to DNA. And similar cases for for a protein to become like catalytic catalytically uh, you know active or like a complex biomolecule, you need like a three-dimensional stable topological structure. So RNA does not have that compared to a protein. So maybe as as goes, time goes by, the evolution favored the you know the the emergence of DNA and protein. So so this is again this is still debatable. Uh, we are not sure whether whether DNA could be the first molecule to evolve. Uh, so a lot of like, few people are working on that. I mean, irrespective of whether it is true or you know not true, whether we need more evidence or not, I just want to emphasize one thing that RNA has a uh, you know central role, a crucial role beyond just being an in, uh, information or a messenger. So that that's what I'm going to touch base today, like how this particular uh, capabilities of these unique biomolecules has been exploited or, or used in uh, in. Uh, uh, Exploited or used in, uh, you know, achieving some of the most uh, uh, challenging issues that we are seeing today. Okay, and uh, yeah, so so this is this is I would say this is mostly the the summary of my whole presentation. So I'm just basically going to touch base upon two different mRNA molecules. Number one being double stranded RNA, and how the double stranded RNA has been used uh, to achieve the first problem that I was discussing in my first in my slides earlier, uh, food productivity. So based on uh, gene silencing mechanism, double strand RNA can be used to achieve a targeted pest killing for an agricultural crop protection. OK, uh, let me quickly look into the, uh, uh, the cartoon here. So basically, like, uh, so this is your uh, healthy plants. And these are your uh, useful, I would say, like uh, harmless bugs or insects, say, for example, pollinators. And uh, these are the beetles, or like uh, like a harmful like any any like uh, uh, beetles or like a pest that is basically impacting the uh, health of the plants. So just by designing a double strand RNA that is specific uh, or selective only to target a particular gene present in this bug or or, or, or your pest, you can specifically specifically target and kill the bug without harming your useful insects. Okay, so how that is being achieved through a uh, RNA eye or a silencing mechanism, which I'm going to uh, like uh, go into a little bit deeper in uh, the slides to follow. So in that way, we can protect our environment or the health of the plant in a very you know eco-friendly and sustainable way without harming other other useful bugs. So that's why it's saying it's very sustainable, it's eco-friendly, and it's a it's 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 a better alternative. I could even say it's the best alternatives to chemical pesticides because the other other side of the problem is that you could address this food productivity issues by chemical pesticides, but but is that a sustainable? Definitely not, because what are the chemical pesticides you are going to use to protect your plant health? It's going to affect all of the other you know non-targeted organisms or useful organisms, and then finally it's going to get into the soil. And from soil, if it gets leached into other water bodies, it's going to kill the aquatic life. And, and finally, it gets into the plants and it's finally coming back to us. So we are going to eat all those all those pesticides and things like that, all these chemical things. So DSRNA could be uh, or can be like a considered or like an used as a biological pesticide or a bio pesticide in that case to put in a very short frame. Right. So the most fascinating difference compared to the uh, conventional chemical pesticides for uh, uh, the DSRNA is very selective, very specific. 
okay and the other side of the coin which is a therapeutic applications coming uh, coming back to the uh, you know the pro pro uh, problem of uh, vaccinating against the new infectious diseases that is that is uh, mrna vaccine so the conventional vaccine we all know how vaccination works that we have been using a uh, uh, either uh, live attenuated uh, pathogen or a uh, killed pathogen or sometimes the antigen or uh, proteins or like uh, you know parts of the uh, pathogen as a as an antigen molecule that's just a conventional approach and then and then comes the nucleic acid uh, vaccination there are some dna vaccines it has some pros and cons and, and the new emerging thing is the mrna vaccine so so basically instead of giving instead of adding your uh, uh, killed or alive attenuated or, uh, or a protein molecule into your body you just basically encode that antigen onto an mrna and then inject that mrna into the body so that if this particular uh, mrna is getting uh, delivered to a targeted cells like an like an uh, immunological cells uh, for example it's an uh, antigen presenting cells like a dendritic cells this mrna is going to get uh, you know expressed and forms the uh, antigen it's going to initiate the or, or elicit the immunological response so it's it's, it's, it's a it's uh, the, the immunology part of it is basically going to be the same how one vaccination works but but instead of directly adding your protein or like an, a whole pathogen we are just like injecting or like on giving or delivering the mrna that codes for a specific antigen okay that that, that is the whole basics of the uh, mrna and, and and compared to the conventional approach the, the potency of this is really high right and uh, the capacity for rapid development as we all know the vaccine development is not an uh, easy thing it might take like uh, like uh, anywhere between like a two to five years or even more than that Whereas if you look at the mRNA vaccine, so uh, the, the concept is very modular. You can quickly make an uh, uh, mRNA, uh, fully active mRNA that can be used for uh, multiple different, uh, uh, you know, against multiple different uh, pathogens. And the potential for low cost manufacturing, manufacturing or uh, growing viruses or growing other, uh, you know, harmful pathogens. It's, it's, it's really, it's not only time consuming, labor intensive, it is also risky because most of these organisms belong to, you know, biosafety level two or three or even higher than that. So whereas making this mRNA is relatively safer. So, so that leads to a huge potential for a low cost manufacture. And then, um, and then a safe administration. So uh, that is also one of the fascinating point of the mRNA. So that's what, that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, we are going to have a quick uh, deeper dive into each one of this. Okay. Okay. Let's quickly get into the agricultural protection. So before getting to that, I'm just going to uh, present to you guys. Like I'm going to take one particular case study, or going to explain how this has been achieved uh, uh, in an. Uh, uh, RNA being as a biological agent for agricultural crop protection, just to give an example of uh, one particular bug uh, that is Colorado potato beetle. So this Colorado potato beetle, or uh, acronym is the CPP, the biological name of this is this, Leptinotarsa disemlineata. So the bug is basically uh, named mainly because uh, so it's 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 very prevalent. It's it's highly prevalent in Central America. It's uh, the issue has been first discovered in a, in a state called Colorado. That's why it's named as Colorado potato beetle. And this beetle is very popular, or it's 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 a uh, highly impacting the uh, crops, the food crops present in the uh, uh, family of uh, Solanaceae family, like uh, potatoes, tomato, pumpkin, eggplant, and such. So potato being a, like a, a sta important staple food. For, for for many people like uh, like uh, people in uh, like uh, uh, central parts of uh, america or like in south america or like even most parts of them africa so potato is like a very important uh, staple food for them so if you could if you think about it like there are population is raising it's it's like a, it's like a skyrocketing and then like uh, if they are eating only potato for their for their as their food the 40 percentage of that is being you know just lost or getting impacted by this particular bug it's, it's going to be a really big issue okay so so let's look at how this cpp has been uh used as an uh you know uh, uh proof of concept study to to mainly say that how this days rna is working okay so shown here is the uh um i would say this is how the the the, the uh mature or the adult uh, bugs will mate and then lay eggs and underneath the leaves and then uh this eggs will 
hatch and then form a larva. These are the larvas and these are the adult ones. You can easily uh, differentiate between the two. And uh, when coming to infesting the plants, so these both these larvae as well as the as well as the adult ones, they, they infest as as a, as a colonies, as like a swarms, like a, not in tens, not in one hundred, not in hundreds, not in thousands, but multiples of thousands. Think about it. Think about it. If you are a farmer, if you are growing this, and one fine day, if you are waking up one fine morning, you're going visit the field, and if, if all of your field is being filled with this bug, what's going to happen? Right? It's 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 a big issue. It's a very big problem. And then what this bug basically does is that it just chews the leaf. So the basic feeding mechanism is chewing the leaf, and like within like a, you know a matter of uh, like uh, hours or days, it completely kills the entire foliage. And then the, the plant is, plant will become like this. And once this entire foliage has been gone, it just quickly go and infect the neighboring plants. And then and then it just keep going on and on, and it's completely you know completely like a, kills or converts the entire field into one into one deadly uh, non foliaging uh, plants. So if there is no foliage, then photosynthesis will stop, and that will impact the you know the formation of the tubers. That's going to uh, impact the, the the formation of the tubers, ultimately the plant health. Okay, so this is one uh, one uh, case study that I want to quickly say, and then uh, uh, a specific uh, essential gene of this Colorado potato beetle has been identified. That is very essential. Say, for example, uh, there are multiple um, uh, developmental stages here, right? So if you if you target one particular gene that helps the larvae getting into the uh, adult form if you target that particular gene then you can prevent you can prevent uh, the developmental stages of this larvae to become a beetle to become an adult beetle if that happens then the, the adult adult are the ones that mates and produce eggs so you can stop right at the stage of uh, larva or sometimes you can take a use any specific excuse me any specific genes that is specific uh, that is very selective for the larva you can use it as a larvae cell or like an adult thing so one such example has been done by a company called uh, uh before getting into the example let me quickly explain mechanism of how does how does this work right okay, this is a colorado potato beetle as i said this is the major feeding mechanism for this one is chewing the leaves right so if you are designing a double strand rna specific for this uh, essential gene and spray it onto the plant as a topical application when this bug comes and feeds this through major mechanisms like chewing or root feeding or sucking. So whatever the DSRNA you are applying to the plant, get inside or being chewed or taken up by the bug. And once inside the bug, it specifically go to the gut and from the gut, it just enters the epithelial cells and then it enters the stomach uh, root. So that this particular double stand RNA, it's, it's, it's in the it's in the it's in the uh, you know uh, whole body or the ma majority of the gut microbiome of this uh, of the cells, and once inside the cells, this double strand RNA it's acted upon by again this is a mechanism how the uh, uh, you know gene silencing works or the post transcriptional gene silencing works. Uh, this is the uh, RNA interference mechanisms, correct? So the double strand RNA has been uh, once it enters a cell, it's been acted upon by multiple protein complexes. Like the first first key actor is a dicer; it converts this dsRNA to siRNA, and this siRNA has been loaded with the multiple different proteins like ORGO and then uh, risk silencing complex. So basically, RNA I uh, induced the silencing complex. So it forms a this huge silencing complex, and then whatever the this dsRNA is very specific to your protein of interest. And then this will go and bind to your specific mRNA, and then it just makes a nick or it completely stops the translation of that mRNA so that the essential protein won't get expressed or your mRNA is being degraded. So that will that will go into impact this, this particular bug and the bug will die. So this is a basic mechanism how uh, you know uh, these RNAi based pest control works. So think about it. If this particular dsRNA is specific only for this bug. Because the, the the mechanism is that it, this this particular step is very selective. Very, it's it's, like, it's based on the complementarity between this uh, the dsRNA that you were designing and the and, and the gene, right? So you need to uh, select a particular uh, thing that is very selective only for this particular thing, but it is not going to affect other related bugs or other useful bugs present in the uh, uh, food web or the food chain, so that 
selectivity would be enhanced. Correct. And uh, this is a quick example of a company called, I think, Syngenta. They are a field trial. Like uh, they basically use the uh, BS RNA against the uh, Cholerida petita beetle, and they and they showed uh, uh, again. This is this is like a big research. So usually they will design this DSR molecule. You need to synthesize that, and you need to check uh, its uh, efficacy as an uh, as a small bioassay, and then you need to apply it for like a, a greenhouse gas a greenhouse. Uh, uh, testing and then finally it comes to field trial. So in the field trial, if you look at it, the field that has been treated with this double strand RNA, you are seeing there is no infestation of the pest. You are seeing all the foliage, whereas the untreated one that does not receive this DS RNA is completely gone. So this is an essential, I would say, is a very fascinating proof of concept that the that the DS RNA has been working. And this is just one such example. Uh, there are like uh, multiple, uh, you know, TSRNA based products in the in the pipeline. And uh, um, so this is this is a proof of concept. And coming to the selectivity, I just want to uh, quickly, uh, you know, uh, touch base upon like uh, one of the other uh, interesting experiment uh, in that in that same publication. Uh, so CBP is our target, right? There is other closely related bug mustard leaf beetle this is also a pest but it is it is it is present in the same order but it is like a, it is not very specific for potato right so they designed a double sense so we are basically having two insects here one is the one is the cbp other one is mlb so if you design a dsrna specific for this bug it's going to kill only that not the other similarly if you design one that is specific for MLB, it's going to kill only that, not others. But if it, if you choose a gene that is present in both of these bugs and then try to test, it has an activity for both of them, right? So, so again, this is very modular. You can you can customize, you can you can design based on your need. Okay, this is a, a very good example for the it's a selective uh, behavior of that. And uh, another important uh, thing is that, like again, if you are if you are considering this uh, double strand RNA molecule to be to become like a biopesticide, there are multiple, you know, in, uh, regulatory agencies for which you need to you know submit an application telling that it's almost like an uh, NDA. You need to tell that like uh, this particular bug is this particular DSRNA material is effective only towards uh, the target organism, but not for other useful organisms or non-target organisms. Okay, so. so Coming to the same example of CBP, uh, as I said, a company called Syngenta, they, they, this is their experiment, and then you could, you could see that the, the DSRNA that they design, it's killing or showing activity only for that particular bug that is called a potato beetle. And it is, it is, it's not showing any activity for its very related, you know, closely related bug present in the same order, Coleoptera, they're saying there is no activity for that. Not only that, within the same family, if you look into uh, the bugs present in other orders like Lepidoptera or Hemiptera, it is not showing activity for any of this. So it is it's very specific. And not only that, as I said, if you look into the beneficial organisms, the one that is highlighted in red has either honeybees or even like flower bug or all other uh, useful uh, pollinators or the bugs, it is not showing any activity. So this is how. It's 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 not only like a very selective in killing the thing. It 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 has a very very uh, you know narrow range, meaning like uh, it's not going to affect all other all other things, right? So so that is that is a very good uh, I would say like a, a fascinating uh, you know way that uh, RNA can be used to to address this crop protection or the pest infestation issues, okay? And uh, moving on to an mRNA vaccine or a therapeutic application, let me quickly uh, uh, dive into what kind of like uh, vaccines are being developed and how the how the actual uh, vaccination works, right? Okay, so again, we'll start with an uh, uh, mRNA vaccine delivery because delivery comes first. Okay, let's look let's look into this. So there are two major type how you can uh, you know make your uh, uh, mRNA. One is that you can make uh, your mRNA and then you can deliver that into your body or you can administer that as a as a vaccine to the to the to the candidates either as a naked mRNA meaning just mRNA or you can formulate that using some nanoparticles like a gold nanoparticles or lipid nanoparticles or like uh, you know like other cationic or anionic polymers etc. So you can do uh, uh, for 
kind of formulations that it increases its you know uh, lifetime or uh, sorry its half life or its like you know its stability things like that and there are multiple different uh, routes of administration have been um, either under you know active research or few of them proven to be useful one is the intratumoral so you can locate a tumor and you can directly uh, add uh, to that uh, you know tumor cells so that this can this can work against that uh, the cancer or intranodal because remember that uh, this mrna vaccine need to get targeted or delivered to a specific targets like your immune cells to raise an uh, to mount an immunological response so you can directly found an a lymph node that's present all over body and then you can you can directly administer to the to your lymph nodes or under the skin like an, you can do like an intramuscular subcutaneous intradural all those things or you can directly add to your lymph through a lymphatic uh, transport or even like ivs uh, options have also been worked out so if you just inject into one blood it's anyway going to get into the lymph right these are the multiple uh, routes by which uh, the, the, the you no know, mrna can be administered so once this mRNA, the active MRNA, the fully functional mRNA is, uh, enters the cell, so the major mechanism by which it enters the immune cell is by endocytosis. So the mRNA that is being endocytosed can be can be taken up by the cell, and once inside the cell, it can it can take multiple different routes. Okay, the fate of that uh, new mRNA is like a majorly like a two different two fates that has been researched as of now. Uh, so first one is mRNA delivery. Second, let's let's uh, it, before going to self adjuvant i will i would touch base i want to uh, explain how it's being useful in uh, you know eliciting immunological response so the mrna that has been taken up by the cell it's 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 being uh, translated into a protein so the translation machinery will come and will like uh, you know uh, translate helps in translating the mrna to a protein and forms a peptide and if this immunological cell is like an uh, if it is in like a professional antigen presenting cells like your dendritic cells it could process the antigen and it could present to your you know t cells it can either fo uh, follow like a like a major histocompatibility one one pathway or it might be two pathway based on what type of t cells is interacting and it can mediate uh, you know uh, elicit like a cell mediated uh, cytotoxic effect or in some cases it can also help to produce like a humoral response just by interacting with the t cells so that these B cells will get primed and then get converted to plasma cells and form antibodies, things like that. So this is the 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 you know the the committed uh, fate or the, the one that we want our mRNA molecule to get uh, used up to to form to produce a peptide, right? Yeah. And uh, I would say the next one, uh, the the coming to the self adjuvant effect, this is mostly considered as like a uh, like a uh, double edged sword. The reason being. The self adjuvant effect of this pathway will get activated based on the purity of your mRNA. So, in addition to your mRNA molecules, if you have other contaminants like, you know, like double standard RNA or other uh, like a truncated uh, mRNA or the mRNA that does not have a poly A tail, or sometimes the mRNA that has the unmodified nucleotides like uh, like uridine instead of pseudo uridine, if, if, this, if the cell encounters those abnormal or aberrant mrna what it what it does is that in spite of going through this translation pathway it will induce this innate immune response it will induce innate immune response and then and then you know it, it secretes interferons and then and then it, this is more like an uh, this is not we want your mrna to go into right so we want your mrna to get translated into forms and Antigen so that that will get prime all your immunological response. Whereas if it goes to this pathway, sometimes it's it's still under again I would say active R and D. It could be both beneficial or detrimental. When I say beneficial, sometimes it, it it helps mature the uh, dendritic cells and then helps to release the cytokines. If that happens, it's going to invite all other uh, immunological cells and sometimes your uh, response get amplified. Or on the other side, it could be really detrimental because if this if this mRNA follows this pathway, it will suppress the translation efficiency. So we just need to like a uh, uh, majority of the research currently today or happening in, uh, in academia mainly to modulate or uh, regulate this pathway in such a way that you start with a uh, very pure mRNA uh, uh, 
shots so that instead of activating this we will majorly turn towards this useful pathway okay so that is a, that is the thing with the uh, that is a uh, major uh, you know the, the pathways by which the mrna vaccine works and if you want to look at some of the examples of like uh, what are the mrnas that has been already you know uh, developed by some uh, uh, biotech companies and then uh, this table explains uh, or gives you like a, like a brief summary of uh, the, the status of those so majority of them are infectious diseases because they raised uh, against like hiv rabies zika influenza all of these infectious diseases and, and, and like major companies like argos curevac masgen moderna therapeutics they are all working on this and this is their vaccine type like what kind of uh, protein they are actually targeting and their routes and uh, this is basically the status of like uh, what by uh, what kind of uh, uh stage that they are in the clinical phase is that like uh, the completed phase one completed phase two or multiple phase. oh before i forget i just want to tell you one one more thing to you guys is that this particular uh review paper that named as three decades of mrna vaccine development i would highly recommend or suggest if any of you interested in how the mrna vaccine works it's it's a very good uh, uh research uh review paper that that summarizes pretty much all of the r d work that has been done so far so i would highly recommend people uh you know who are interested to look into this one okay and uh not only that uh in addition to all of these diseases our our current uh the bug under uh, question the coronavirus so the madonna company has developed a, a vaccine an mrna vaccine against sars cov2 it is named as mrna1273 it's basically they are encoding they are making an mrna that encodes uh you know the protein the that is a spike protein present on the surface of the coronavirus so it's it's roughly i would say like uh, like 4000 uh, nucleotides and then they encode the spike protein onto the mrna and then they will inject that into the into the vaccine candidate and once inside the cell as i said it gets uh, translated to a protein and then it will it will express the uh, the spike protein so that will start the immunological response okay this is like a very good example of like how quickly uh, things have been developed because you all of you might have or a few of you might have heard this in the news that uh, they uh, developed this in a record history of like uh, 3 months right which is which is which is very fascinating like that's a that's a one of the advantage of using this uh, nucleic acid vaccines and then again an important thing is that this could be modular So if you are going for a protein vaccine, like you just you know the protein expression itself is has its huge, you know challenges. But here, like if you want to you know mimic uh, yeah, a mutant of the spike protein, if you want to check uh, multiple variants of the spike proteins so or multiple multiple formations, right? There's a pre-fusion complex, there's a post-fusion complex. So you can you can introduce those mutations into this mRNA and try to make you know some make a uh, spike protein something that is very viable in in producing. antibodies okay and the data basically like uh, shows that like as of may 2020 uh, the the they injected they administered this to like a uh, 45 subjects in the phase 1 and 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 all of the 45 subjects they are developed and binding antibody only eight developed a neutralizing antibody the binding antibody meaning like uh, the, the 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 proof of concept has been so basically where mrna has been translated by protein and it started to work whereas neutralizing antibody means it completely stops its uh, you know completely uh stops uh infection uh, or completely binds the infectious particles so that it's no longer be a, a threat to the host cell okay so again this is a very uh, preliminary data so a lot of things are going to come so the administration two doses of three different uh, um concentrations of this mrna so again it's a very very uh, preliminary or i would say like still under active research so if any of you interested i would i would i would want them to go and look at this how how things are how the moderna company is working on this um so that is a major thing now we have seen how this rna has been exploited or used to to address these two major issues and we are uh, next part of the topic or the uh, final part of the topic of the presentation is going to be how how this rna has been made how we are making it we in the sense the beta companies how they are making it for uh, achieving these applications or how this has been made in an academia for for doing much of the r&d work so the answer lies in a uh, uh, thing uh, or a new emerging technology called a cell free production or a, or a cell free bioprocessing 
So meaning like we all know about a cell-based bioprocess. Let me get into the uh, quick flow chart. Yes. We all know this cell-based bioprocess, right? So we have like an upstream processing in which like you need to, you know, uh, let's, let's take an example of very common protein production. Say for example, you want to express a protein. So what you will do, you will go and uh, like uh, take a DNA that is code for the protein, put that in a vector, do code optimization and construct your vector and do a, you know, transform into your cell or your expression system. It could be like a bacteria or yeast or whatnot. And then you do like a strain selection, do, do media optimization. So once that upstream processing is done, you will put that into bioreactor, you will grow to a certain cell density. Once, once this culture is achieved a certain, uh, you know, high cell density, you will, you will turn that into a production phase just by, you know, if it's an inducible system, you just add a chemical inducer, like you are, lactose or your IPTG or if it's like temperature based induction you do that so there are two different phases present in this uh, fermentation stage one is the growth phase in which you need all of your cells to grow first and then you convert that into a production phase in which your uh, protein of interest is getting expressed and then once the once the production is done you will you will do one harvest because again it can't be it can't production can't happen for a very long time right there are multiple things that's going to happen like the cell is going to see like an uh, like a energy shortage the cell is going to enter like a uh, metabolic burden state because you are over producing something which the cell with the cell cannot cope up right at some point of time it's going to stop and then you're going to harvest the cells and you're going for a downstream purification to get your protein so this this we all know this right this has been there for for, uh, for at least like uh, two decades we all know this one on the other side when i mean a cell-free system or a cell-free bioprocessing basically what happens is that in 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 spite of growing or in spite of expressing your protein inside the cell we are just doing it in vitro so this is mostly in vitro protein synthesis we are doing the same protein synthesis or a common protein production in a tube in a, in a, in a, in a test tube or in a reaction tube or or even in a reactor right so you basically you start with the cell extract when i say cell extract you basically grow the cells you lyse the cells and use that as a cell extract this is basically like an enzyme soup there is no active cells that is growing, but it's just a cell components. It has all the cytoplasmic uh, components like ribosomes, you know, other like uh, transcription factors or translation factors, or whatever, or any polymerase, things like that, or some salts present inside the cells because you need a certain ionic strength or like a buffering capacity for, for your reactions to happen, right? Or or some of the cofactors present inside the cell will, 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 will act as a, will give like a conducive environment for this in vitro synthesis happens and then you add your dna template that carries the information for your protein of interest you add your uh, uh, substrates so basically you need to add your ribonucleotides because you are going to transcribe you're going to form an mrna from this dna and that that mrna needs to get translated to a protein right so you need to add all your amino acids all your ribonucleotides and then if there is any cofactors like uh, magnesium ions or any other ion that is required and then uh, all of these uh, reactions are energy intensive. You, you need ATP for every single step. So you basically add some uh, uh, like a self uh, ATP generation system so that ATP will get generated because the cell soup cannot generate ATP efficiently compared to the actively growing cells. Okay, so after you incubate all of these together, after like a four hours, your protein will get expressed, right? So the example here is a green fluorescent protein. So you start with an, uh, this uh, experiment of a uh, enzyme soup. And at the end of the four hours, you see like a, a green tinge, which basically says that your protein has been expressed. So this is a cell-free uh, system or a cell-free bioprocess in which everything happens in vitro as opposed to what is happening in the cell-based system, right? So this technology has been used to produce RNA for, for the major applications uh, today uh and the and some of the important or like a very essential or fascinating advantages of the cell-free system over cell-based system is this a wide transport limitation say for example if you are carrying out a pathway if you're carrying out a pathway in which you need to you need to uh carrying out a pathway in in vitro you need to like start with the substrate whereas in cell-based system the substrate needs to cross the uh transport barrier or if the you know or if the product that is whatever is formed it, it again needs to come out of the cell things like that whereas in here you can avoid the transport limitations and you can directly add your substrate so keep increasing your uh, uh, substrate in terms of uh, amino acids or your uh, ntps you will get more and more protein 
and the product can be removed really quick. We don't need a, a that complicated downstream processing. You, st you, you still need some kind of uh, purification based on your application. Say, for example, for mRNA, you need some pure stuff. And environmental monitoring. You can quickly monitor how the reaction is happening, what is the pH of the reaction, you know, what is the other like conductivity or like ionic strength of the reaction, which enzyme is dying, things like that, which we cannot do it in a cell-based system. And rapid sampling. You can quickly sample and then and then and then you know run an uh, SDS page or like run a uh, uh, if you are making an RNA run a nano chip and then you can quickly read how much of RNA or protein you are making. So these are some of the advantages of the cell-free system. So using this cell-free system only, majority of the upcoming, or I would say the biotechnology industries today are making uh, the RNA. I'm going to give you a quick example. We have only 10 minutes. Let me let me quickly wind up in, the, in another five minutes. So I'm going to uh, talk about like how we uh, greenlight biosciences as a company making this uh, RNA for both of these applications. So as I said, we start with the uh, uh, message, your uh, DNA. The DNA can either uh, be produced through like a PCR. So you 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 have all your uh, uh, relevant promoter, you have your gene of interest, and then you either start with as a PCR fragment or you clone that into your plasmid and then put this and transform this into a cell so that the cell can replicate and make multiple copies of your plasmid. You can either start with the plasmid DNA or a, or a PCR, put it in a tube and then add your NTPs, add RNA polymerase, add cell extract, and then and then your all RNA polymerase is going to start transcription and incorporate all these NTPs to make a to make an RNA. Okay. Uh, one thing is that again, there are multiple issues, scalability, cost, things like that. NTPs is very expensive because you know the energy rich molecule right phosphor related compounds are always expensive in cells perspective because you need more atp to make the ntps right so in addition to start this whole reactions with ntp as a substrate what green light is doing is that we are starting with nmps as a substrate because nmps and ntps are much less expensive compared to ntps because again they are less energy rich compared to ntps so we start with nmps nucleated monophosphate like uh, cmp ump gmp and amp and we convert the uh, NMPs to NDPs, and you can convert, you're converting that NDPs to NTPs using a set of uh, a proprietary like enzymes present in the green light uh, reaction mix. And again, because of the intellectual merit, uh, I cannot expose what that one is. And every single step requires an, an ATP molecule. So we are also having a self regenerating ATP system. So that converts whatever the ADPs that is formed back to ATP so that the reaction will keep going on. So our mix will contains the reaction starts with the NMPs. You have your DNA template, you have your polymerase, and you will form RNA. This, this is the major concept of how we are uh, making RNA from uh, from uh, you know the uh, DNA in our uh, in our company. So if you look about how we are making DS RNA, double strand RNA, in addition to start with the sense strand. So basically, you need to make your sense strand and also an anti sense strand, right? So you have an DNA that encodes for a sense strand, you have an, another DNA that encodes for anti sense strand, add both of them together, and then uh, the transcription happens. Once these two strands are formed, these two are completely, you know, complementary to each other perfectly, and then it forms a double strand RNA. And this double strand RNA can be, you know, checked for its quality, like how much of our DS RNA we're making, what other impurities we have. So we have multiple steps to remove this polymerase to DNA and all other components. And then this DS RNA can either be directly added or be formulated in a way that it can be, uh, you know, applied onto the plants as a sprayable uh, technology or sprayable methodology or, or other relevant methodologies. So this is how we are making our DS RNA. And coming to mRNA, so for the for making DS RNA, you just need only the uh, sequence, right? Because it's just only the information. Whereas in mRNA, it is not only the information. You need to, once this goes inside the cell, this mRNA needs to get converted or transferred to your protein. So for that, you need to make a fully functional, mature mRNA. Meaning, in addition to the sequences, you need to make sure that you have proper untranslated region, both the 5' prime and 3' prime end, because that, that contains message for you know, proper ribosome binding sites and, and such. And you need to have your uh, capping, you need to have your polyadenylation chain just to, you know, increase the, uh, the half-life or the stability of this mRNA molecule. Because if we don't have both this capping and this polyatails, it will easily get degraded by the, by the, by the. So 
RNAs is present all over the cell. So you need to make things like that. You can also do multiple, uh, you know, uh, strategies of, of engineering. Like you can, you can uh, uh, just add instead of adding uridine, you can add like pseudo uridine. You can add like one methyl pseudo uridine or five methyl cytosine things like that, so that you can make an mRNA molecule that is very close to uh, native mRNA uh, rather than, you know, being a completely foreign mRNA so that you can avoid the innate immune sensing that I was talking about. Okay. And in some cases, in addition to this uh, uh, relevant uh, functions of an mRNA, some research are adding an, another, uh, uh, you know, piece of uh, 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 sequence that basically helps this mRNA to become self-amplifying mRNA. So it's, it's more like your ORI. You have origin of interest present even plasmid, right? So if you have an ORI, the plasmid can self-replicate like that. If you have this particular sequence, I think this is mostly derived from some of the some non-pathogenic viruses. So if you include this particular sequence to an mRNA, you're converting this mRNA into a self-amplifying mRNA. So once it goes inside the cell, in addition to being transferred to a protein, this will get keep you know self-replicating itself. So that you like you will have like a sustained uh, uh, availability of uh, mRNA. Okay, okay. So you need to make sure that you design all of these, and then like uh, and then and then you start your uh, cell-free reaction, and then at the end of it, you have this. As I said, the purity of mRNA is, is the biggest concern. Whereas for dsRNA, even for dsRNA, purity matters. But again, if it is if if it is not going to be pure, you're just going to apply it to the environment, but if something is that is not pure, it's not going to be active. Whereas here, you need to have like pure mRNA because it's going to get injected into your body. If there is any contaminants, as I said, it's going to cause the unwanted uh, uh, reaction. I think this is my final slide. Uh, so the mRNA that is produced in cell-free system, if it has other contaminants like the dsRNA, double stranded RNA or other, you know, truncated RNA or RNA with no poly A tail, or if you are having unmodified residues, like if you have only uridine instead of uh, pseudo uridine, in addition to being expressed or being or uh, getting translated to a protein, it also, you know, initiate your innate immune sensing, as I said, it's basically the same thing. So there are a lot of uh, internal uh, sensors that can identify this double stranded part that can identify this unmodified uridine and that that will you know initiate this uh, interferon production and sometime as i said sometime it, it would be beneficial so it can induce or it can help desimaturation sometime it could be detrimental that it can completely block the translation whereas if you use a nucleoside modified purified mrna so you make an mrna in a reactor or whatever scale that you are working at and then and then you purify it in an FPLC and to remove all the contaminants and you start with the pseudo uridine instead of uridine that particular you know pure modified mRNA is getting inside the cell there is no uh, immune uh, innate immune sensing it just directly get translated to a, to a peptide and it will you know uh, uh, prime the immune cells and start the immunological reaction so purity matters okay and uh, as always, these are some of the opportunities on the other side of the coin. We always have some challenges. One is the scalability because we know that cell-based bioprocess has been, uh, you know, developed or optimized for for uh, multiple decades. Whereas compared to that, cell-free system is less very new. It's emerging, so scalability is still a issue. Uh, I would say, as a company like uh, Greenlight Biosciences, we started uh, working on this at a very small scale in a in a PCR like a. 100 microliter scale and we translated all the way to close to uh, to 1 liter to 10 liters to 100 liters now we are we have a capacity to make a double strand rna or a thing for a 150 liters so so it's still a lot of work are still going on and then uh, the next one is the longevity of the reaction when i mean longevity of the reaction as i said you are carrying out your uh, your synthesis in an enzyme soup right so all of these enzymes are prone to get uh, you know damage like an oxidative damage or like a uh, you know, other other damages, so that your 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 enzymes can be active for a, for a, for a long time, right? So so once it crosses its half life, once it's getting uh, uh, destabilized, the, pro, the 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 productivity is going to stop. And then the next issue is reuse of the cell free system. Is that like the cell free system can be reused, like our immobilized uh, immobilization based uh, cell based system? These are the multiple avenues that the research is still ongoing. And, and to try to uh, like uh, uh, address some of these challenges uh, for the cell-free system. 
and 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 in particular in in, in specific if, if you look at rna based solutions or rna based uh, products that that's coming in the market there are there are multiple regulatory agencies uh, both at the both at the you know federal level or at the global level like like our uh, like fda like usda like uh, or um, epa environmental protection agency so you need to like you know like uh, consider things for uh, you know all of these uh, stringent regulatory issues or uh, agencies for 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 anything either it could be an agriculture or it could be a healthcare so all of these needs to be met so you in addition to you know establish a proof of concept you need to do multiple additional uh, accessory experiments to make sure that it is not going to make any impact or like a detrimental effect for the non targeted ones or uh, not going to start any other unwanted reactions so so as i said it's a it's a new emerging but uh, fascinating promising technology both the technology and as well as the the, the new rna based uh, product itself and i think that's that's pretty much thank you all for your uh, patience and hearing me uh, and, and and i'm very happy to you know address the questions Uh, yeah, thank you very much, sir, for the informative session on using RNA for pest control as well as for making vaccines. Um, these are problems that the world faces right now. Uh, we have a few questions here, sir. So we'll start. Uh, could you start answering them? I'll ask you the question, sir. Sure, I I could also. Okay, I also seen multiple things in chat. Yeah, sure, uh, Swadika. Yeah. Uh, the first question is: Does the same technique, that is the RNAi-based pest control mechanism, could be an effective candidate for locust control? Yes, you can consider because the locust is also like you know like uh, uh, can be considered as a pest, right? So it's basically a pest. So one thing that I was explaining is that like uh, even if it is not completely killing the pest, but if you try to identify that one particular pest is very seasonal. You know, one particular pest is very seasonal, and if, if we predict that it's this is the one that is usually coming, and if you could, you know, even if it is, even if you not completely kill it, but if you could stop its life cycle, say for example, you, you design something that specifically, you know, converts or like a, a impact or a stop the developmental stages from being a larva to an adult one, you could you could potentially stop it, right? Because all of these locusts or any, any pest, you say they have multiple life cycle they have they have the life cycle right so they need to go to multiple developmental stages so yes this can be used um okay so and the next question is um what are the drug delivery systems used to deliver rna based vaccines uh, which one of these are more likely to work the best drug delivery system for vaccines i think uh, uh i touched based upon that a little bit right maybe this question was asked even before that so right now if I'm getting the questions right, I think the, the question is about the route of administration, right? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you guys see my screen? Yes, so we can see it. Okay. Yeah. So this is a basic thing. So the route of administration is, is through multiple things, and and when we when we think about the delivery itself, as I said, either it could be a naked mRNA, uh, or it could be a uh, uh, you know formulated way. They they are trying to formulate uh, with an other nanoparticles, and then and then see how that increases the uh, you know the stability or the shelf life of uh, the uh, uh, vaccine candidate. And sometimes this is this is the uh, in vivo technique there is an another possibility that this can be uh, delivered ex vivo when i say ex vivo what they are doing is that they are basically uh, say for example if it's a tumor one so they will uh, you can like uh, harvest the dendritic cells present in the cancer patients and then try to uh, deliver this mrna either in the naked form or in the formulated form into that uh, uh, extracted uh, dendritic cells through like you know uh, direct physical contact or through electroporation, things like that, so that you can you can uh, artificially get this into that dendritic cell, and you can grow the dendritic cell. You can let it mature in vitro, and then you can infuse it back to the patients, cancer patients, and then and then that can work. I think for things like cancer, that will work. Whereas for uh, infectious diseases, things like that, the in vivo would be more effective. Just directly make this mRNA vaccine, and then and then 
administered through multiple routes, either naked or USB nanoparticles. Um, okay, so thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is, uh, what are the advantages of RNA-based vaccines over DNA-based vaccines? Yeah, it's a it's a uh, good question. You know, like uh, any new technology or any new emerging techniques have uh, multiple pros and cons. Uh, one thing is that when you add your uh, uh, DNA vaccine, so like uh, biochemically, it's like one step ahead, right? So you need to convert the cell needs to work to you know convert your uh, DNA to mRNA first, and then this mRNA needs, needs to get translated to protein. There's no one additional step. So when you say one additional step, but inside the cell, there could be multiple other, like, you know, antagonistic reactions or predatory reactions happening. And another thing with the DNA vaccine is that sometimes the DNA has a uh, potential, uh, you, you know, to get, to get integrated into your, the genome of the host. Say, for example, if, uh, if, if a virus is uh, actively, uh, you know, the infection is active so that's how the viruses uh some of the retroviruses work right so they will from the rna from their from their genome they will convert that rna to dna and then the dna is getting incorporated into the genome so that is one basic uh you know potential risk that if you are administering a dna vaccine sometime there could be a possible potential thing is that the dna is, is going to get integrated into the genome of the host whereas that cannot happen with mrna and also mrna is a short-lived uh you know unstable molecule compared to the dna so it's basically like you need to give multiple doses but that is okay you can you can avoid the risk of being uh, permanently getting integrated i'm um, okay so thank you sir and the next question is how do you separate rna from cell free system yeah that's that's a very good question again uh, so easy thing is that like again it's it's uh, looking back into basic uh, molecular biology thing uh you can add uh, let me go to the uh, process okay okay this one right so you have you have what do you have so in your cell free reactions you have your ntps you have your rna polymerase you have your uh, dna right so you can get rid of the dna by adding uh, say for example the dnas dnas is a protein that cleaves only dna but not rna you can add uh, you can add uh, uh, D, uh, dnas to get rid of the protein and uh, in order to separate your protein and rna again basic uh, molecular biology uh, principles you can add like a, a specific uh, salting out reagent say for example like a, a lithium chloride it's very known to specifically precipitates only rna but not dna and protein you can use that so that all of your dna that you are making will get precipitated and then you can gain uh, you know uh, Get rid of your other contaminant thing like on unreactive NTPs, proteins in this in the supernatant, and you can clean your pellets and then resuspend it back to get only RNA. But again, this is at a small scale. We need to think about how this is going to be applicable to an to an, a larger scale. You can do like a specific uh, affinity based uh, you know purification for an for an RNA. Like you can have like an, say for example for an mRNA, you can make a preparatory column that has your oligo DT in it so that only your RNA will get attached to the column and you can selectively elude that uh, RNA. So there are mul multiple different, uh, uh, I would say, basic biochemistry and biochemical and molecular biology techniques like chromatography and other solvent purification. Um, okay, so the next question is, could you give insights on problem associated with COVID vaccine production? Problems associated with the COVID vaccine production, uh, I'm not completely sure about the question. Is that about any vaccine or is it about the mRNA vaccine? I uh, think specific to mRNA. Specific to mRNA vaccine. Specific to mRNA vaccine, as I'm as I'm uh, uh, as I was like uh, quickly explaining, uh, one is that production of this mRNA is not a very big issue because you can you can easily make it. One thing is the purity. That also somewhat is achievable by all the uh, current uh, developments. So once this get inside the cell, again, we do not know that, that, that you don't have a lever to control it, right? So it can go to multiple different ways. So you can make sure that whatever you are injecting is highly pure so that you can avoid, you know, you can avoid your uh, immune sensing, uh, sorry, innate immune sensing. That's the one thing. And other thing I'm I'm talking about is that as as this as the study says, they could find a uh, you know binding antibody, meaning it's getting translated to protein, 
but but we are not sure whether all of these persons will develop a neutralizing antibody neutralizing antibody means it completely makes us uh you know the infectious particle inactive so so we are we do not know how long it's going to take for the immune cells to make a neutralizing antibody when you have binding antibody it's basically mark the cells for other immune cells to come and you know uh, help whereas uh, this by itself developing a neutralizing antibody it's there are multiple unknowns, right? Like it's still, everything is like under active research. These are some of the problems that I think uh, uh, I, I, I could perceive. Um, thank you, sir. The next question is, how do you safely separate RNA from system enzymes? RNA from uh, system enzymes, I think that's what they're basically, uh, it's pretty much alluding to other uh, protein uh, so if I'm getting it right, cell-free system, cell-free system. Yeah, so one thing as I'm again uh, touch based upon is that you can either do like a affinity chromatography so that you can you can make a, a, a you know a poly uh, poly T a DT column so that that will that will specifically bind your bind to your poly A so, and then you can elute or purify your mRNA. Or for specific uh, uh, dsRNA, like in addition to your uh, uh, coding sequence, you can include an additional uh, tag sequence, and then and then you can specifically purify based on uh, affinity chromatography. Because anyway, once this dsRNA goes inside the uh, cell, it's going to get processed by the dicer, and then and then so you can you can add any tag to the dsRNA for affinity purification, and for mRNA you can use the you know, poly DT tag. Okay, thank you, sir. That can get, that can get rid of majority of the proteins. Okay, sir. Um, and the last question is, um, won't genetically changing the RNA detriment the nutritional quality of the plant? That's a very good question. I uh, so one thing is that we we need to uh, we need to, we need to understand one thing is that we are not. Genetically, let me go to that uh, specific slide. Yeah, so we are not genetically engineering anything. So this is this is completely different from GMOs. This is not genetically modified uh, thing, right? Because as I said, this double strand RNA, if it is a DNA, that is possible because majority of the way that us, uh, you know, genetically modified uh, GMOs are getting propagated is through like a, like a uh, DNA propagation, right? So we are not going to add anything to the to the. We are not going to change the genome of the plant at all, right? This is not GMO. We are just going to uh, use this dsRNA, spray it over to the plant, and even if this dsRNA, in addition to getting into the bug and killing it, if it gets into the plant, the plant has other uh, mechanisms to completely, you know, uh, inactivate this dsRNA. One thing is that even if it gets enters into, into the cell, this dsRNA is not going to be specific for the genes present in the plants. So it's not going to do anything. It's not going to do any silencing for the plant, number one. Number two is that this is only dsRNA. It's not going to get incorporated into the plant as such because this is not a DNA. So, so this is completely different from GMOs. Um. Thank you very much, sir. I think that concludes the Q&A session. Uh, we'll now go on to the vote of thanks, sir. Um, I'd like to start by sir. thanking you uh, for taking the time to join us today and imparting us with your knowledge on using RNA for food productivity as well as vaccine pro against infectious disease and the production of these RNAs. I'd also like to take this time to thank our patrons, our HOD, Dr. G. Shri Kumar, convener, Dr. M. Chamundeshwari, and our co-convener, Ms. K.R. Preeti, for giving us the support and making this event possible. And finally, I thank all the participants for your cooperation and ensuring that the event was seamless. Uh, the next session will be tomorrow, that is the 17th of June at 11 a.m. Uh, with our speaker, Dr. Nirmal K. Sampat Kumar, who is a research associate at King's College London in UK. He will be talking on aryl hydrocarbon receptor and multi multifaceted proteins. Uh, kindly log in 15 minutes ahead to not miss anything. Uh, we appreciate you for being here. Stay safe and I hope to see you all again in our next session tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Thank you, the participants. Patika for arbitrating this and, and all the entire organizing committee and, and the Department of Biotechnology for giving me, you know, 
uh, time to share my expertise and experience with all of you guys. So thank you so much again, including the participants, and uh, special thanks to Ms. Preeti, who has been you know instrumental in organizing all these things. Uh, thank you so much, and we hope all of you have a very good evening and, and take care. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, take care, all of you.